Hey, what's up, guys? This is Mike Wolf, and this is the Spoon Podcast. And today's guest is Ben Leventhal, who many of you who are in the restaurant tech space, restaurant media space, know of Ben from his work as a founder of Eater, as a founder of Resi, and now he's on to his new startup, Blackbird, which made news in October when they announced they're going to be building essentially a next-generation loyalty platform using combination of Web3 and Web2 elements. And I'm excited to see where Ben goes with this. So I thought I'd bring him on the podcast and have a conversation with him. Ben will be at CES on the future of the restaurant, the tech powered restaurant panel moderated by Kristen Holly. We also have Kristen Barnett from hungry house and Joanna Lapore with McDonald's. It's going to be a really interesting conversation. And that is one of six panels we'll be having. We are having a dedicated full day food tech conference at CES run by the spoon so if you want to go get your tickets and i'd hope to see you in vegas but for now let's get to my conversation with ben leventhal hey ben how are you doing i'm doing okay michael how are you i'm doing well we just talked last week we're getting ready for ces you will be at the ces food tech conference talk about restaurant tech and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Vegas. But for now, we're going to talk about, a little bit about your company you're building, Blackbird, and how you got to where you're going. I think a lot of people who know about restaurant tech, insiders in food media probably know a little bit about your work. They've probably for sure heard of Eater, and they've also probably heard of Resi. And now you're on to, I don't know if it's your third act. Is this the third company you founded, Blackbird? Uh, I've been a part of several other startups, but this is the third that I have founded. Yes. Okay. And I think talking to you for the last couple of years, just kind of bumping into each other online, I could tell that something was percolating in your brain and uh, you've been kind of circling around the idea of Web3 and and kind of figuring out your next act. So it was exciting to see you launch that, but we're going to get into Blackbird and dive deep about what you're thinking for the vision of the company, what this whole idea of Web3 uh, meets food and restaurants means. But f- before we do that, let's familiarize people a little bit more with your journey to how you got there. You founded Eater, I think, was it 2005 or so? Uh, I think it was 2005 when Eater started. we founded Eater, yep. If I recall the time, it was it was pretty much focused on New York City and nightlife and, and restaurants. It wasn't what we all grew to New Eater as a property of, of Vox, where it became like this hyper-local uh, a site about every city, you know, there's an Eater Seattle, there's an Eater San Francisco, but at the time it's largely New York City. What was the original vision for it? Well, we founded Eater because we were just obsessed with the restaurant scene in New York. And, and we were obsessed as outsiders, meaning we just wanted to visit these restaurants, dote on chefs, um, just sort of talk inside baseball without really being on the inside. So we just thought it was so interesting and fascinating um, and, uh, and cool. You know, I sort of have grown up my whole life. I've been obsessed with restaurants, um, restaurant, being in restaurants is, is, a, is a very happy place for me. And, um, and Eater really is born out of that. It's born out of that enthusiasm. You know, in the early days, Eater was about, you know, raising up restaurateurs and chefs and, and, and turning them into our heroes. You know, the, the, the early days were, you know, Mayor Danny Meyer and, and uh, Sir Keith McNally and, and a um, whole other cast of characters. Um, you know, they just made the scene and continue to make the scene so vibrant, so interesting, so entertaining. And we just couldn't get enough of them. And, I wanted to write about them and, you know, and uh, I think we were accused of, of, of being rather breathless at times, which probably was true. Uh, but, but we yeah, just were yeah. just so, it was just so fascinating and so interesting to us. And at the time, you know, early 2000s, we started to see the rise of things like blogging. Um, it was a confluence of things. There was the chef as celebrity thing that really started to happen. And New York City in particular had guys like David Chang and and all those other guys that were really doing interesting, new and kind of revolutionary things. And so it, it just, the timing was really good. We definitely got the timing right. And, um, and I think when people ask about why Eater uh, worked and, and was successful and broke through in a fairly crowded field, 
I do think a lot of it comes down to the timing and the fact that we were talking about um, chefs and restaurants, as you said, right? When those, you know, when chefs and restaurants were sort of um, becoming a mainstream cultural phenomenon, um, definitely guys like David Chang are responsible, you know, some folks before him, but are responsible for chefs becoming rock stars. And, you know, people like to talk about rock stars. And I think we definitely picked up on that, whether we did so sort of purposefully or just instinctively and, and got lucky, you know, <laughs> I don't know, we could debate it back and forth, but we, but we, <laughs> yeah. but we definitely got the timing right. It was the early days of blogging and uh, the software was, was at that point readily available and you could stand up a blog easily, which is really what we did. Um, and we just started writing, you know, we only really had a couple of rules when we started writing Eater. And one of them was no restaurant reviews. Um, and the other was really no restaurant, you know, no food porn, but, um, but everything else was just us wanting to track the scene and, and, uh, and, uh, do play by play on what was happening. You were to characterize food media, restaurant media at the time, there wasn't really the inside baseball behind the scenes talking about like how they create the magic. It was, there was some food porn, there was lots of reviews, but you guys had a different lens that you wanted to bring to it. Well, there was two kinds of food media, right? There was the legacy food media, which was the reviewers and the, and the publications like food and wine and, and gourmet. And then there were the message boards, you know, chow hound, e gullet, things like that. And those were really sort of community, you know, obviously community message boards, town square type environments where people scream from the rooftops about the restaurants they had just been to and, you know, um, were excited about. And there was nothing in between. You know, if you just wanted good day-to-day sort of real-time news and color on the restaurant scene, that didn't really exist. And uh, that's, that's, I think where we knew we wanted to play. Um, and what's interesting is if you look at how the old line publications reacted to Eater and to the other blogs, you know, what happened is they got much more real time. You know, it, it, what they, what they realized is if we were going to talk about restaurant openings on an hourly by hourly basis, then, you know, Florence Fabricant couldn't wait till Wednesdays to talk about the openings if she wanted to continue to have, get scoops. And so I think that was sort of the process of, you know, the New York Times and others starting to think about blogging and, and think about more digital first um, coverage of the scene. But that was the thing. It was just real time food news and information in a, in a form that was polished enough that it didn't, it was, it was, you know, better reported and more polished than the, than the message boards and quicker and more real time than the old line guys. And, I think for that reason, we found a lane. You did. And eventually you did go national. And I think if I were to look at like how Eater has persisted and survived, I think they've done fairly well under Vox. You know, I used to work at a big tech blog and gig home, you know, we competed with TechCrunch, and I, I feel like tech media has actually become a little bit superseded by just overall social media, et cetera. I still feel like there's a lot of value in the hyper local kind of behind the scenes restaurant coverage that Eater still does, that just, it has a certain timelessness to it. Listen, people care about their neighborhoods. That's yeah. uh, a truism. I mean, that's never going to change. And uh, when you write about your neighborhood or, you know, your neighbor's neighborhood, people, they want to read about it. And um, it's always been, I think, one of the foundational sort of, ideas of, of eater and publications like it is, you know, keep it local. And eventually you guys did get acquired from Vox, which was really the descendant of SB nation, which was already a hyper local publication. So they saw what you guys were doing it made a lot of sense. And eventually you exited them. And I think around 2014 is when you founded Resi with Vaynerchuk and Montero. And yep. did you kind of sit around for a while, think about what your next, next act would be? Or when you were still at Eater, did you have an idea, hey, there's this, there's a need here in the marketplace? There was a bunch of things I did in between. I worked at, um, I worked on a startup called Kitchen Surfing that was, 
Uber for chefs of a sort. If you wanted a private chef, you could go on an app and get one in theory. Didn't work very well. Um, I worked at NBC for a little while. Those ideas are starting to get traction now though. <laughs> the Uber for chefs is, is one that comes around every five years or so, five yeah, or yeah. 10 years. And there's a crop of them that pop up and somebody will figure it out at some point. It, 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 we, we couldn't, but somebody will. Um, so yeah, I did a, I did a several things in between. Um, but, um, towards the middle of 2013 into early 2014, we, you know, the idea of taking on the reservations companies and open table and thinking about all the ways that those legacy players had fallen short was really, um, starting to become really interesting and exciting and compelling to me. And that's how we got started with Resi, just an observation that tech was falling short for restaurants. I've used a lot of open table, still use it periodically. You know, you saw something where the tech was falling short. What was the need in the marketplace where the guys like open table were not meeting? Well, there was two big things. One is the pricing model was just from a different time, a dollar per cover as a fee to use the software, it just doesn't work in a, in a, in an environment where a lot of popular restaurants don't need to pay for their own customers. So there was this really sort of predatory loop of open table buying, stealing restaurants, customers and selling them back to them. You know, open table is an extremely good performance marketer and SEO and SEM and all kinds of other, um, and, uh, all kinds of other things that they do to attract to to attract customers and to attract diners, and then they take those customers and they sell them back to the restaurants. We just felt like that model made no sense. Um, in, you know, in 2014, 2015, it was just it was from a different time. That was a big big part of it. And then alongside that, we just felt also that the software hadn't evolved either to serve a mobile first customer consumer or to serve a modern restaurant from a format and, um, and characteristic standpoint, you know, and, um, and we just felt that that was, that was the essence of the opportunity is to create something mobile first, really focused on how, um, a modern, uh, consumer tech forward consumer was wanting to, um, to, to book and discover restaurants. And equally for a modern restaurant, a piece of technology that um, felt like it was, it was accretive to the business and not a drag on it. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we obviously um, over time ev- re- uh, refined that thinking and, and uh, turned e- Resi into what it ultimately became and is, but that was the observation. It's just, there's no technology that was there uh, that felt like it was actually a good piece of technology for the restaurant industry and the reservation space at least. Yeah. Yeah. And you co-founded it with Vaynerchuk who was a food guy. It seems like from the, his early start as a social media influencer, I think he like got started doing like wine reviews on YouTube or something. Um, you probably know better than he I do. He was but- a wine guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He started as a wine guy. And I don't know if you guys are just two food guys in New York that connected, but how did that come about? Well, when I was um, in the early days of Eater, that was when Gary was building his wine library business on YouTube. You know, Gary got his start producing these these wine review videos on YouTube. And we just got connected through mutual friends. And, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, we were both sort of pioneering new kinds of food and wine content. And somebody said, you guys are kind of doing the same thing and you should link up. And, um, and we were, we kind of became friends quickly at, at that point and just kind of stayed in touch. And, um, I always, I see Gary, you know, once a quarter or twice a year, maybe for dinner. And, and, um, we're always kind of brainstorming and talking about ideas. And, you know, when we saw each other in, uh, in the, the second half of 2013, it just kind of clicked that, and we both saw, saw the opportunity. And as we can continue to talk about it, we both just got more and more excited and, um, it sort of, it sort of at some point became obvious that we were going to go and pursue it. 
And the company was successful. You guys had an exit to American Express, I think around 2019 or so. Yeah, mid-2019. Yeah, and did you stay on with the company for a bit, or was that a pretty quick exit? I did, until yeah. the end of 2020. And again, in between, it's, you had this period of taking stuff in, I think looking around. You probably saw what Gary was doing uh, with regards to his interest in NFTs, Web3, and you know, I kind of saw you, I think 2021, we bumped around a little bit and just online and I could tell you're, you're gaining a little bit of interest in the world of web three. I saw your PC you wrote, I think early this year on, on LinkedIn, can NFTs save restaurants? Mm-hmm. And maybe that was like the clearest sign that you were going to do something. And so I think it was, it was, was it October or maybe it was August? When did you guys launch black blackbird? We launched Blackbird. We announced the business in October. Yes. Okay. Uh, we, we actually closed the round uh, a couple months before that um, and had been doing some work behind the scenes. Um, and I've really been working on the business since the start of the year. Uh, but yeah, we announced it in October. So is this putting together that think piece on LinkedIn, a way of you kind of the stuff is floating in your minds and kind of getting some things clear in your head and maybe kind of positioning early on or my, it's part of my process. When I write those kinds of pieces, it's, it's as much for me to figure out what I'm talking about and, and for me to understand uh, the landscape as any, as, as it is for me to sort of explain anything. I just sort of am putting my thoughts out there in part just to help galvanize, form them and, and, uh, and organize them. But yes, I've definitely been thinking about NFTs and Web3 and how they can play for the restaurant industry uh, for a little while now. And one sentence, I was just reviewing that, your piece earlier, and one of the things you wrote is, the idea of NFTs is not so much as unique tokens, but as community membership cards. Uh, Maybe the best way to understand the utility for hospitality. And this, this, this word community, um, I think, is interesting. You, I think you used it when you described Eater as well. So this, I think community building and, and, and restaurants kind of go hand in hand. We saw this idea of, hey, what does Web3 mean for restaurants? So when I saw you guys, when you launched Blackbird, when you came out, you, you described it as something where you're going to basically be building something that leverages both Web2 and Web3 components. You talk a little bit about like, what you're thinking there when you, when you announced it. Well, you picked up on exactly the right detail. I do think community is um, is the point. And one observation that I took from the early days of COVID when restaurants closed down is that actually restaurants have these incredibly strong communities around them. And so much time is spent talking about how bad the restaurant business is and how uh, hard the restaurant business is and 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 of course, in particular, how hard it is to keep restaurants open. And I think that's all true. But to me, there was something very encouraging about how much an individual restaurant's community rallied around it in the early days of COVID. And we saw we saw customers uh, buying all kinds of things from restaurants that were closed uh, because they wanted to support the restaurant, because they wanted to see the restaurant see through to the other side of COVID meal kits and merch and sauces and dressings and wine, anything the restaurant was willing to sell consumers were willing to buy. And I just think that was just such a strong testament of the connectivity between consumers and and the restaurants they love. And that's what we're trying to help restaurants um, scale. Um, because it shouldn't just be in moments like COVID that the community rallies around a restaurant. There should be an ongoing sense of community and membership and loyalty at good restaurants. And that should be fundamental to the business. And, and I think that those ideas can make the restaurant business much stronger. Um, but I think there's a technology gap, um, that exists that we'd like to, um, address uh, before that can be reality. I think the restaurant needs a lot of technology, a lot of tooling that it doesn't have today to organize its community and 
create loyalty programs and um, uh, loyalty software uh, that is going to empower that community to, to stay and to grow. If you look at the existing loyalty software market, you know, that that's a market that's been around for a bit, but much like you identified with Resi versus open table, you identify gaps. What are the gaps that you're seeing in the existing landscape of loyalty software for restaurants? Uh, you know, to, to be clear, I think there's some really, I think there's some really solid technology in the loyalty space. Um, I think it's for the most part, operating for larger scale restaurant organizations. I don't think the small scale restaurant necessarily has any tools at its disposal that are purpose built for restaurants of its size. Um, and so we're really focusing on independent and small restaurants and the larger restaurant groups and chains, um, the national brands, they have, they, maybe someday we will build software for them. Um, and maybe we will, uh, build something that they find super compelling. We certainly hope we do, but we're focusing on the independent restaurant as a use case. Why web three, why NFTs, what are they doing as an enabling technology platform to kind of bring about this world of new loyalty that you think, uh, you can't get necessarily with just traditional, I guess, web two software or older, older software. You know, look, one of the, one of the whys is because, um, we do have this, idea in web three that I think, uh, is really important, which is that web three, um, especially through tokenization allows us to incentivize early adopters. And we want to build this platform and this company in true partnership with the restaurant industry. And that means, you know, incentivizing restaurants to come and join us early. And so, so one answer is, why web three is because web three provides us a solution to a, to, to reward restaurants for joining us early. Um, the earlier you join the platform, the more long-term rewards you're going to get from the platform. Um, and that really is sort of a construct that's emerged in web three over the last, you know, I guess it's almost a decade now, um, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then I think resonates and is important to us. I think um, also Web3 gives us some cutting edge tools um, around identifying and credentialing guests. That's going to be very useful as we set up um, as we set up our platform. Can you get a little more granular on, on the earlier you join, the more benefits you get for restaurant owners? What does he? What do you mean by that? What specifically, if someone who's not fluent in Web3? Can you explain to a restaurant owner what that means? So I think we will be sharing more information about this in the coming months. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't know that I can get much more granular at this point, but the, but I will say uh, we're going to introduce a uh, native fungible token and um, you know, in uh in non web three parlance, that just means that we're going to create um, essentially a sort of in-house currency um, that's going to be used to, for various purposes on the platform. And it will have, it'll be um, valuable if you're using the platform. Um, we're thinking about it, for example, as um, essentially a, a currency of sorts that restaurants can use to incentivize customers to visit them. Uh, you know, they can be exchanged for free round of drinks or um, possibly access to a table. And so the restaurants who have more of that currency will have more leverage when it comes to um, attracting and retaining their customers. Um, so it's very early days. And I think there'll be lots of details that we work through and we announce, um, especially into Q1 next year. But, you know, the idea is that there's going to be this, um, like I said, in-house rewards currency, and it'll be valuable on both sides, the supply and demand side of the, of the, uh, of the marketplace. And as restaurants join the platform, 
they'll be incentivized for coming and joining us early um, because we're going to reward them with more of those tokens. So to the customer side of the equation, it sounds like this will also be an incentive for customers, but what other, you talked a little bit about credentialing of customers, you know, you talked a little bit about like, how do we reward the early adopters? I think also a little bit thousand true fans, the, the super fans of restaurants. What sure. is Blackbird doing for the restaurant diner? Well, every restaurant diner is a, is a, a, reg, a potential regular. It just needs to be uh, convinced to become a regular. So, you know, we think about every customer, every person who walks into the restaurant as, uh, like I said, a potential regular. And so the question is just, how do you build a loyalty and incentives framework to make that happen? One of the things that I think I've heard you talk about, I've heard um, Adam Broadman talk about as well, is this needs to be approachable. We don't want consumers having to put you know, MetaMask wallets on their on their phones and trying to figure out how to download an NFT. <laughs> like, and so when I hear you talk about merging elements and combining elements of Web 2 and Web 3, I, I, what I'm translating that to be is like you're going to make this – have the user friendliness of web two, but the capabilities of web three and what that, that implies. Yeah. And honestly, I would say, I think we've already spent too much time on the web three part of this, you know, consumer products are consumer products. You have to build, you have to build consumer products to be magical and extremely simple and, and extremely useful and extremely intuitive. And that's what makes them successful. And, uh, whether it's web two or web three or web anything else, that's the point. And, and so web three, you know, as a consumer, it doesn't matter if it's web two or web three or anything else, it, it needs to have those characteristics of a great piece of technology. And so, you know, we'll use, we'll use web three technology the same way we use any other technology, which is to say, we're going to build a technology stack and we're going to build a, platform at Blackbird and we'll use whatever component pieces of technology makes sense to, um, to realize our vision, you know, and I do think launching a technology company in second half of 2022 and it's 2023, if you want to be cutting edge, you've got to look at what's happening in web three. I think that's, that's cutting edge. Right. And so, um, we're looking at it very closely and I think we're making some really, thoughtful, um, exciting decisions about how we can, how we can put it to use, um, and how we can point it at our use cases, but it doesn't matter for consumers. It shouldn't matter for consumers. And hopefully we'll build a product where, um, web three helps to create that magic and isn't, is, you know, is, 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 is part of, part of what makes it magical. And, um, and honestly, if it doesn't make it magical, we won't use it. It's not a case where you're just talking about, hey, we, we're Web3 passionate. We're, we're just passionate about building software. And this is an enabling technology we can use. But we're not uh, one of these scenarios where we're just going to be evangelical about, hey, using the latest technology. Look, we think that it's compelling. I mean, we're excited about, we're excited about building a technology company in in 2022, 2023, we're, we're excited about the tools we have at our disposal, Web3 tools among them. Um, you know, I think we, we, uh, we are excited, but, I, but again, it's not about, it depends on, are we excited to market Web3 to consumers? No, because it doesn't matter, because why would consumers care? Like, we're again, we're just not focused on the, on the real question, which is, you know, is it going to be magical or not? Is it going to work? Is it going to yeah. add value? Is it going to enhance the hospitality of restaurants? Is it going to make rest, make consumers want to come back to the restaurants that they love the most? It doesn't matter what the technology is. If that happens, where else, do, where else do you see this type of new technology being applied in the world of restaurants? I don't have strong views there to be honest with you. I mean, I think there's, interesting experiments happening. I guess I do, I do feel that restaurants are ultimately, once you sit down at the table, they should be pretty analog places. Technology uh, should not be front and center. It should fade to the background and 
you know, restaurants should continue to be about sitting around a table with people that, that you want to sit around a table with and should be about eating food and making eye contact and enjoying the atmosphere of the restaurant. Uh, so I guess I'm not particularly excited about technology that takes away from that. Um, but anything, any product, any piece of technology that can do something interesting for restaurants and enhance that moment and, and, and again, enhance the hospitality of, of what is sort of the restaurant in the end, the form factor of the restaurant. I'm all for it. We saw your old partner in, in Vaynerchuk have some real success raising some money through for fly fish, which is, you know, kind of deemed as the first NFT restaurant. I've kind of felt like that was almost a one-off or, or at least they, they benefited from Gary's celebrity to a certain degree. I think some of the subsequent attempts haven't seen nearly as much success. What do you think about using things like NFTs for having to avoid traditional financing to build restaurants? Do you think that's something that could be replicated or is it kind of more a unique thing among people like celebrity chefs who can do that? I think it's hard to raise money for restaurants, period. I think what the fly fish guys have done is really interesting and it looks like they're going to pull it off. Um, it looks like they're going to open a really exciting restaurant and club just like they promised. Um, but I think it's hard no matter what, you know? Um, and I think, you know, you're talking about a crew with fly fish. These guys know what they're doing, you know, and, and it took them a couple of years to find a space and to, it's going to take them another year to get the place open. You know, it just is hard. It's hard to raise money for a restaurant. It's hard to open a restaurant. But again, to me, it goes back to community. You know, if you, if you have a concept um, or you're a chef or um, a restaurateur and, and you have a community around you and, uh, and you feel like they can, they are interested in investing in, um, in that community and being a part of that community and paying to be a part of that community, then I do think that, um, you know, the NFT is an, is a really useful way of, of putting that community together, but it's not, a, it's not, it's not going to be, you know, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's not, you know, NFTs are not like, uh, they're not a panacea and they're not going to solve problems for you. If, if you don't have a good concept or you don't have a community, you're not going to create one out of thin air just because you say the word, you know, just because you say it's an NFT. Um, but if you do have those things and you do have a compelling vision, um, then I think the technology makes a lot of sense. What's in store for 2023 for Blackbird? Well, we um, have said we intend to launch the product. So that's what's in store. And um, I think we intend to uh, provide some additional details about our launch restaurant partners and the um, dynamics of our native token early next year. Uh, so I think those things will be exciting as well. Beyond that, you'll um, just have to wait and see. All right. Hey, well, Ben, where can people find out more about Blackbird? Blackbird XYZ? Blackbird.xyz, yeah. Blackbird.xyz. We're on Twitter, Blackbird underscore XYZ. Come find us. Come find us. All right, Ben. Thanks for spending time with me. Anytime. All right. I want to thank Ben Leventhal for joining the podcast. I've enjoyed getting to know him a bit over the past year, bumping into him in places like Clubhouse and having him as a guest at some of our events. If you want to meet Ben in person, you can do so on January 5th at CES at the Food Tech Conference. We'll be having a future of the restaurant, a tech powered restaurant panel. And Ben is one of the guests there. So come and join us on January 5th at the Food Tech Conference at CES. All right, everyone, that's it for now. We'll talk to you soon.